It wasn't all that long ago that Satan seemed all but dead and buried. The casualty of a modernist thinking bent on rationalizing the supernatural out of existence. Evolution was a good enough explanation for the world in which we live. There was no need for belief in the supernatural. Then came Joseph Stalin's gulag. The vast system of prisons and work camps in communist Russia in which tens of millions of people were killed. That was followed by Hitler's Nazi Germany in which over 10 million people were killed. Then came Mao Zedong's communist China in which we estimate as many as 70 million people were killed. You could add Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia in which 3 million people were killed. All these regimes were so dark that they couldn't be explained simply by human evil. Satan came back with a vengeance. Evil of such proportions can only be explained by the existence of supernatural forces of evil beyond this world. Then in 1983, psychiatrist M. Scott Peck, famous for his 1978 book, The Road Less Traveled, published People of the Lie, Hope for Healing Human Evil. In it, the Harvard-Columbia-trained psychotherapist argued that exorcisms of demons was not only heroic, but it provided the only recourse for many of his patients. Peck provided the deliverance industry the air of respectability it desperately needed. Christians who exercised demons from people could point to a highly acclaimed mainstream thinker, psychiatrist who also believed in the existence of demonic forces of evil. Since that time, folks, hundreds of books have been published and movies produced attesting to the dark world of demons and the satanic. Today, starting with 9-11, on New York City and all the heinous terrorist attacks that have occurred in places around the world, more and more people agree that the existence of Satan in a dark world of spiritual forces of evil, only that can explain many of the terrible things going on in our world. This fall, Portland Public Schools approved the Satanic Temple in Portland starting an after-school club at Sacramento Elementary School in Park Rose. Their stated purpose is to counter Christian evangelism in schools with clubs like Good News Clubs. They will promote a scientific, rationalistic, non-superstitious worldview. In their attempts to shower contempt on Christian faith, they will ultimately be promoting the enemy of Christ, Satan himself. And they're doing this with elementary students. How can we overcome this growing darkness in our world? Is there anything we can do to slow down or stop the evil stirred up by Satan in the world? Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' leading disciples, speaks about this in his letter to first century Christians in 1 Peter 5, 5 to 11. If you'd like to follow along with me in the Bibles we have under the seats in front of you, it's on page 1223. So Peter is writing to Christians who are severely persecuted under Emperor Nero in Rome. Let's just recap some of the things he said so far. He said, one thing he said is expect suffering. Expect that you're going to be persecuted. Don't be surprised. He's also said, be different. You don't want to suffer for stupid things you do. Most of the problems we encounter, the suffering, is, is our own choices. We're just reaping a harvest. He says, so be holy. Then he says, grow in your faith. Get to know the scriptures so you're deeply rooted, so when hard times come, you don't give up on your faith. Then he says, talk about Christ. Some people were saying to Peter, Peter, should we just kind of lay low and keep quiet? Otherwise, we might lose our jobs and be persecuted. And Peter says, no, you have a greater obligation to obey God who says, go and tell people of all nations than to obey the dictates of your culture that says you shouldn't try to tell people about your faith. Then he tells, tells us to trust God. He uses a phrase uh, seven or eight times in the book, in the same way. 
Anytime something's used that many times, you know it's important. It's referring to Jesus that when he was crucified and beaten, he didn't threaten, he didn't sue, he didn't lash back, but he trusted his Father. And then he tells us to love. He says, above all, love others deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. Now in 1 Peter 5, 5 to 11, he says, you can gain victory over Satan. Some of the problems you face are caused by Satan. Now maybe you don't believe in Satan. Maybe you're not sure you even believe in Christ. But possibly you're struggling with depression. Or have had thoughts of suicide. People that have attempted suicide but did not succeed tell us that there's a voice they're hearing that says, do it. You're worthless. Just take your life. Nobody cares about you. You've done too many bad things. It's, it's too late. Just get it over with. It's one of Satan's finest temptations. Maybe you're struggling with illness or a stubborn addiction or a crumbling marriage or you're battling with the temptation of pornography. Satan is a master at discouragement and temptation. Anything to get you off track and keep you from following Christ. Now, I'm not going to address today how we can stop worldwide terrorism and mass murders like we saw in, in several countries. But I want you to listen to Peter's six wise pieces of advice and how to gain victory over Satan individually. First thing he suggests is humility. 1 Peter 5, 5, in the same way, there's that phrase again, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. In the same way, refers back to P Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 21, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself who judges justly. We are supposed to trust God and humble ourselves like Jesus did. When you do that, then you can submit to your husband and allow him to lead in the marriage. Humbling yourself allows you to kind of get rid of your self-centeredness and serve your wife. If you're a young person, that humility helps you to obey your parents and realize God has placed them over you. Humility helps you to submit to your employer, take direction, or to leaders, our national leaders. Even to humble ourselves before those who persecute us and not lash back against them. Why be humble? He tells us in 5.5, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. When we're proud, we think we're so important, we feel we're invulnerable. And that makes us easy prey for Satan's attacks. Maybe it would help to see yourself as a turtle on a fence post. Uh, Dr. Robert Lamont, a pastor at Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, uh, said when I was a boy, uh, we'd be playing and once in a while we'd see a turtle on a fence post. And when we saw that, we knew someone had put it there. That turtle did not get there by itself. He says, that's the way I feel. I feel like God has put me in places, blessed me. I mean, all of us, we didn't make ourselves. We did not save ourselves. We did not determine our parentage, our intelligence, or our wealth. All that we have, we owe to the grace of God. Humility causes us to distrust ourselves and put our trust in Christ. Trusting in Christ protects us from the attacks of Satan. The second thing Peter suggests to overcome Satan is alertness. Verse 8, be alert 
and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He says there's a devil. He prowls like a roaring lion. Therefore, you need to be alert and sober. I think Peter's remembering his experience in Gethsemane. Jesus told him, Peter, stay here and watch and pray while I go over there and pray. Peter, and Jesus came back half hour later and Peter's asleep. He said, Peter, come on. Wake up. Stay alert. Then he went off and prayed again, came back, and once again Peter was asleep. Said it a third time. Come on, stay alert. And then the guards came to arrest Jesus, and Peter's half asleep. He cuts off the servant's ear of the guards, and, uh, and then he follows along Jesus' trial so he could kind of monitor what's going on. And a little girl, couldn't be more than a middle schooler, said, Hey, you were one of his followers, weren't you? No, I don't know what you're talking about. She came back a little later. She said, yeah, you speak like a Galilean. I, uh, you're one of his followers. No, I don't know who, I don't even know who he is. He did that three times. And then the third time, he was so embarrassed, he realized, you know what? I just denied my Lord, the center of my life. And so he was humiliated and felt like God could never use him again. But then Jesus was raised from the dead. And Jesus uh, cooked him a breakfast after the resurrection. And he, he said to Peter, do you love me? He said, yeah. Well, then feed my sheep. He asked him a second time, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, Lord. Then take care of my flock. He asked him a third time, do you love me? And Peter's getting a little like, well, why didn't he ask me three times? Yeah, I love you. Then take care of my church. God showed him that he could use him again in ministry. He was not done with him. Uh, but he got pummeled by Satan when he wasn't alert. Satan and all the fallen angels are not physical beings, but they are as real as the flesh on our bodies. They are brilliant. No human, unaided from above, is a match for an angel. Especially in angels whose intellect has been sharpened by malice. From the Garden of Eden to the present generation, Satan and his demonic followers have honed the craft of temptation. The temptation is focused on the mind. Spiritual warfare is a battle for the mind. So we must stay alert. Critical to staying alert is prayer. Verse 7, Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He says, whatever you're anxious about, tell him. Pray to him. Whatever you're stressed about, give to him. Pray to him, man. And then in Peter's, or Paul's famous text about spiritual warfare, at the end, he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We're to pray. In the wake of the election, some of you are very happy about how the election went. Some of you are forlorn about what happened. Many of you may be afraid, wondering what's going to happen with the new leadership. But here's what we know. We know that God is sovereign. The Bible teaches us that God puts people on thrones. He puts kings in positions, leaders in positions. All through the last three months, I was praying, God, your will be done in this election. I didn't like this candidate. I had some worries about this candidate. And so I was like, God, you're, you're going to put somebody in the presidency and I pray that you would, your will would be done. So I believe God's will was done. And now one thing for sure we know, we are to pray. Believers are always called to pray for their leaders. So pray for our country. That you can do. Third thing Peter does suggests to overcome Satan is awareness. Verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We're used to seeing lions in a zoo. They look pretty harmless. But Peter's readers were seeing lions in an amphitheater tearing apart 
defenseless Christians. Peter says, be aware, Satan is like a lion. He's prowling. He's seeking someone to devour. He's seeking someone. He doesn't seek a whole church. He seeks individuals. He picks us off one at a time. And then Paul, in his famous words about spiritual warfare, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Be aware, Peter says, that there is an unseen enemy who is evil, who is bent on destroying your faith in Jesus. He's evil. He's powerful. He's harmful. John Wimber, in his book, uh, Power of Evangelism, tells about preaching in Johannesburg, and they brought to him, after he had preached, a Zulu boy who was 14 years old. But he had stopped growing when he was seven. And so his feet were all grotesque and some toes were missing. Uh, he had cleft palate. His teeth were all pushed out. Um, he just mumbled. Um, so they introduced him to him and uh, Wimber talked to him and he just kind of made grumbling sounds. So he got down where he could see the boy. Remember, he's just seven years old in stature. And he looked at him and he looked like a haunted animal. And when he mentioned the name of Jesus, uh, uh, the, the boy just pulled back in terror. That's when he realized he was dealing with a demon. So he asked some colleagues to help him. And uh, they, uh, some that were experienced with deliverance, and uh, one of his colleagues, uh, Becky Cook, discerned that it was a curse that had been placed on this boy, probably when he was age seven. How'd she get that? Prompting of the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, and so they prayed that the curse would be broken. And it was. And then once the curse was broken, they were able to deliver the boy of not just one demon, but several demons. The change in the boy was dramatic. He came back the next night. He could recognize John Wimber. He could walk on his own strength. And uh, they prayed for him again. And uh, mother uh, told them within three months he had advanced back in school and he advanced uh, to two grade levels. Satan is harmful. He destroys people. He's the author of suicide. He'll do anything to keep people from Jesus. The Bible suggests that Satan is behind all non-Judeo-Christian religions. And uh, we believe that began in Genesis 11 at Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Sounds harmless enough, but we, we believe what they were doing is they were building this huge tower, maybe larger than any skyscraper we know. And they said, if you want to worship God, you go to the top level. And so people would go up there and they're worshiping. But they had all this strange stuff and they weren't worshiping God, they were worshiping Satan. So God decided to do something about it. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. Now up until that time, everyone was a descendant of Noah and they knew about God, the truths about God. Here at Babel, they began worshiping the alternative, Satan. And then when God gave them various languages and spread them around the world, what happened? The oneness of God was lost. And people began establishing local deities. But the Bible teaches that these local deities are really not gods. They are demons. Deuteronomy 32, 17, they sacrificed to false gods, which were not God. Gods they had not known. Gods that recently appeared. Gods your ancestors did not fear. So all around the world, people are establishing new deities. And then the Apostle Paul says, no, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons. They think they're offering them to an idol. You know, safe idol, maybe a god of some kind, but no, it's to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. He says to Timothy, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and fall, follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. 
in 2 Corinthians 11. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So what, he, what the Bible is suggesting is that when you worship Krishna, you think you're worshiping a god, but you're really worshiping a demon. If you're worshiping the gods, uh, the many gods of the Hindus, you think you're worshiping a harmless idol, but you're worshiping a demon. And the Bible would suggest when Muhammad received his teachings, it wasn't from Gabriel, but from a demon. All these attempts, Satan, one of his great attempts, all the religions in the world, to keep people from Christ. Fourth thing Peter suggests you can do to overcome Satan is resistance. Verse 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith. Satan is clever and powerful, but he can be resisted. Don't be misled by the temptation Satan will whisper in your ear. Just give in to this temptation, then it'll go away. It's not true. It'll come back with a greater vengeance. Instead, Peter says, resist. Satan is like a bully. He retreats only when he is resisted. James, Jesus' younger half-brother, says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's a promise. How do you resist Satan? Paul tells us in Ephesians 6.16, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You put your faith in Christ. You put your faith in the Scriptures. And you use the Scriptures, the sword of the Spirit. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When Satan attempt, uh, tempted Jesus, how did Jesus respond? He quoted Scripture. That's all he did. The, the Word of God is powerful. Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. When you're tempted, remember, there are a lot of other people with the same temptation. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That's a promise. You will be able to bear it. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So you quote that to the tempter and watch for that way out. It will come every single time. The fifth element Peter suggests to overcome Satan is support. Verse 9, because you know... Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. He says you're not alone. People all around the world are facing the same kinds of sufferings. Other Christians are being tempted. We always think we're the only one. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian writer, uh, talks about the... Gulag, in his book, Gulag Archipelago, uh, the, the vast system of Russian prisons. And they understood how important support is. And so when they brought in a new uh, prisoner, uh, they would isolate him, the prisoner, put him in a cell all by himself. And the, one of the first things they wanted to do is interrogate. They want to extract some information. Uh, they were trying mostly to uh, put in prison the, the writers, the thinkers, uh, the leaders, the, the highly educated, the teachers, the professors, the pastors. And uh, they would keep them alone. When they come into the office, when they're in the hallway, they interrogate them alone. They didn't want them to have any chance of having any contact where they would get maybe a faint smile from another prisoner or a look of hope. Hey, I made it. You can too. They realize how important uh, support is. Norman Shawchuk was one of my favorite professors in my Doctor of Ministry program at uh, Trinity University in Chicago. And he told about a pastor who went to a new church and... Uh, he was sad to leave behind a uh, community group. Uh, he called it a covenant group of five men. And so uh, his first day as, uh, as the new pastor, he said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to miss that group. And so uh, if any of you would like to be in one, just let me know. He did that the second week. He did it the third week. And after the third week, somebody came up to me and said, you know, pastor, you ought to quit making that announcement. Just do it. And... Uh, the pastor says, well, I'm new here. I don't know who would want to be interested in doing that with me. 
And uh, so that afternoon, uh, th this guy called him. He says, are you really serious about doing a community group? Yeah. If I got a group together, would that be all right? Sure. So we called him back a few days later, and he says, I got a group. Got eight people. Is it, do they all have to be members? I said, no, probably not. Okay, six are not members. So they got together. The pastor had no idea who was going to be in this group. And he got there. And the first one he saw was a woman who was a peroxide blonde. And she looked like a prostitute. And sure enough, they got talking and they found out that's what she was. Met another guy who had long, you know, really straggly hair. He looked like he was probably drunk on the street. And sure enough, they, when they introduced themselves, that's what he was. So the pastor said, well, okay, why don't we study life together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So they tried that for a couple weeks, but the members weren't too interested in that. I'm, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a hard read. And uh, one person said, I thought maybe we were going to pray for each other. Yeah, the pastor said, yeah, of course, we can do that. Another person said, I thought we were going to study the Bible together. The pastor said, yeah, we can do that. And so they began praying for each other and the prostitute said, you know, I'd like somebody, I'd like you to pray for me to stop prostitution. I hate it. <coughs> the only reason I do it is for the money. And so the next week she came back, she says, hey, I got a job as a waitress. I'm done with prostitution. And when the drunk heard that, he said, I'd like you to pray for me that I could stop drinking. He came back then a week later, he says, I haven't had a drop of liquor since last week. Well, word of this group and the answers to prayer began to get out around the whole church and people were coming up to the pastor and say, hey, how come you're spending all your time with these eight people? He says, you want to be in a group like that? You can start one. And so groups began starting all over the church and uh, that church doubled in size in one year. We have community groups in our church. We have 12 right now. I would hope we get it up to 18 by, uh, by the end of next year. And uh, I, I, I wish for every one of you that you would join, uh, be part of a community group. Uh, it's just critical to have that support. The last element Peter suggests to overcome the power of Satan is God. Verses 10 and 11 are the greatest verses in this text. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while you're going to suffer a little while you're going to be tempted for a little while it will not go on forever will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever amen Peter says, God himself will restore you. He won't assign this to an angel. A proper perspective on Satan and spiritual warfare is focused on God, not on Satan's schemes. We know Satan prowls. He's a lion on a leash, the length of which is determined by God. God will restore you. He will put back what you need in your life. He will right all wrongs. I think Peter's probably thinking again of his experience with Jesus. After he denied Jesus three times, he felt like such a loser. He failed his Lord so much and God could never use him again. And then Jesus was raised from the dead. And Jesus met Peter at a breakfast where he cooked breakfast for the disciples and he said to Peter, do you love me? And Jesus said, yes. I mean, Peter said, yes, I love you. And uh, he said, feed my sheep. And uh, he asked him this three times. And then the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 writes... What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Satan is serious. He is dangerous. He's evil. But he's no match for God. Verse 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
Paul says in all of our temptations, all of our sufferings, all of our persecutions, all of our troubles, all of our battles with Satan, we are more than conquerors. It's important to note that we overcome not on our strength, but in the power of the risen Christ. The little Greek word for conqueror is nekao, which means to win, to be victorious, or to gain a surpassing victory. But that's not the word Paul uses in this passage. The word Paul uses here is hooper nekao, super conqueror, which means to vanquish beyond recognition, to gain a decisive victory, to conquer exceedingly. With Christ, you are a hooper nikao. You're not going to just eke out some tiny insignificant victory. You're going to win a smashing victory over Satan. You can gain victory over Satan. Peter tells you how. Be humble. So you keep your trust on Christ and you don't think you're invulnerable. Be alert. Be prayerful. Be aware that there is a Satan. There are spiritual forces of evil. They are dangerous. So be aware. Then resist. Satan can be defeated only by being resisted. If you give in to him, you lose. You resist him, he flees. Then get support. You can't make it as a Christian as a lone wolf. No one ever has. You need a support, a, a discipleship group, a community group, something where people are praying for you. You're not going alone. And then God. Recognize God in your life. This is the most important of all that Peter mentions. You rely on the power of the risen Christ. And Paul tells you you can overcome. We're not talking about someday in the future. This isn't once I get my act together. This isn't once I can beat this stubborn addiction. Maybe there's a giant who has everyone around you paralyzed. Maybe no one thinks you can beat it. But I'm telling you, by the power of the risen Christ, you can. You are a hooper nikao, more than a conqueror. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Peter's strong words. That Satan is real, Satan is dangerous, but he's no match for you. We stay close to you and your power through the resurrection, Lord Jesus, and we are more than conquerors. We can defeat him, resist him, overwhelm him. And so I pray that for everyone here. I want to give you a moment to respond to him. If I could use just to pray silently, if you say, I believe it, Tell him you believe it, that you are more than conqueror and you're going to, with his power, defeat Satan, the temptations that come your way. If you've never given your life to Christ, do it right now. You ask him into your life. Then you have the power of Christ's resurrection living within you. I'll give you a few seconds. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the words of the Apostle Peter. They encourage us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.